and you should have gotten a notification that this is being recorded. So welcome everyone, I'm Mike Knuckles. I'm the Ag and Natural Resources Team Leader here at Cornell Cooperative Extension in Watertown, New York. Um, happy to have you guys here and anybody joining us later, it's a pleasure to have you as well. Um, this is gonna be a very informal presentation and I'm happy to take questions and, and uh, exchange information and, and see how other folks do things throughout the state. Um, my background, a little bit of background about me, I am a, a gardening geek. I've been gardening since I was a little kid. Um, my first market garden experience was a wheelbarrow full of tomatoes at the end of our driveway that I began selling when I was like 10 years old. Um, and I think that's piqued my interest in, in local foods and gardening and gourmet foods and all everything in between that since, since I was a kid. Um, so if it grows and can be eaten, that's my interest. Local foods are, are certainly a passion of mine. My degree is in environmental science, um, so a bit of a different formal training. I've got a minor in city planning, and I used to work for the Army as an environmental manager. Um, currently, I sell at the Watertown Saturday Farmers Market as well. And um, so hopefully, if that background can give you a little perspective on, on how I see things and my experiences to, to know, so that you know where I'm coming from. Um, we've kind of done a quick introduction already before we began recording, but we've got folks from throughout the state uh, who have uh, different markets and uh, different experiences, I'm sure. So let's, let's dive into the subject matter. So to start with, what is market gardening? Well, pretty simply, this is growing horticultural products, typically produce to sell it at market, kind of common sense, but it can be at any scale. So when I was a little kid selling vegetables, I was indeed a market gardener. So if you're in an urban environment and maybe you only have a half acre, or maybe you have 300 acres of carrots, you are by definition a market gardener. Um, growing vegetables is not the same thing as selling them, however. So, so one of the key things to be a successful market gardener requires business skill. And a lot of this workshop is going to talk about the issues that market gardeners face and how to deal with them. This is a 101 course though. So this is an introduction for newbies just getting started. I'm not going to go into a lot of the, um, detailed growing methods or anything like that. I mean, we could do an entire webinar simply on growing carrots organically or, or different things like that, different growing methods, um, pest management, those sorts of things. Where we're going to focus this evening is planning, how growing at scale differs from maybe a home garden in many cases. We're gonna to touch on legal requirements, uh, whether it's food safety, taxes, those sorts of things. And marketing. One of the key things about market gardening is being able to sell what you grow. And that's a lot more difficult than people think. I often get calls from folks going, I want to become a market gardener. I want to do this. And I ask, ask them, where do you plan to sell? How do you plan to sell? Well, I've already planted it. Now I have to figure out what to do with it. And unfortunately, that's a common refrain. When you become a market gardener, one of the first considerations should be where and how you're going to sell the items that you're growing, especially if you want to make any money. And I think most of us do. So the four things we're going to cover, first of all, planning. We're going to talk a little bit about growing, mainly how it differs from home gardening, harvesting, and some of the key things related to that to get your produce safely to market in a condition that's saleable as well as how to sell different selling venues, places to sell, some of the legalities and issues with that. Uh, we're going to touch on food safety um, and even things like taxes, those sorts of things. So the most common question that I get is, what should I grow? We, we get new growers that come visit us here at Extension and they say, what can I grow where I'm going to make a million dollars? And that's, well, to make a million dollars is certainly a 
a, a hefty goal, but not one that I will dismiss because there are people in the country that have done that. Um, they've gone on to become nationwide wholesalers that feed into Walmart, for example. So it's not out of the realm of possibility. Um, most people doing market gardening are doing this as a side niche and uh, side income for the most part. And we'll talk about some of those statistics. But this question of what should you grow is a really tough one. And I want people to think analytically about how to make that decision of what to grow. And there's several factors that go into this. So I want you to think about these three questions. Um, as you find your niche as a market gardener, ask yourself what you want to grow, what you can grow. I mean, certainly here in Northern New York, we are not growing uh, mandarin oranges anytime soon, not at least not profitably. Um, and then thirdly, what you can sell profitably. And while I indeed have Meyer lemon trees as a, in my, my house and have actually sold those at the farmer's market, I certainly can't sell them profitably and would never uh, recommend that to anyone. So let's dive into each of those. As far as planning, what can you sell profitably? Every market is different. Every farmer's market you go to, every neighborhood, every community, there are different preferences, there are different price points, People look for different things. They're different cultural values. The first thing you need to do, and this is just like in planning any business venture, is to determine who are the customers and what are those customers looking for. You need to find out what's going to sell, what's going to be most profitable for you. So we're going to dive into this first question of what can you sell profit profitably. Your competition is going to play into this. Um, summer squash is something I don't grow often. I don't tend to sell it because we have four or five vendors at our farmer's market who have it in piles. I find it to be too much work for the very small dollar amount that summer squash brings. Um, celery yak is something that I, at the moment, still have a surplus of uh, that I planted quite a bit of because I knew nobody would have it. And it sells at a pretty high price. Unfortunately, not many people buy it. So there's a trade-off. So what's your competition there? None, but is there a market for it? Um, we get questions about hops. Should I grow hops? Um, people are interested in it. Unfortunately, hops are pretty difficult to sell because there are a lot of growers. Beer makers have very specific needs when it comes to hops. And there's a very well-established market nationally. So, so when people ask me about hops, we usually have a long discussion. Uh, I work with Amish growers who don't have refrigeration. Um, at our particular specific farmer's market, I can specialize in things like lettuce and very delicate greens that those Amish sellers don't have, because as soon as they bring it to market, it's wilted 10 minutes later. Um, so that's something where I'm looking at that competition and making a, an informed decision. Yeah, I'm not going to mess with summer squash because my Amish friend has it. However, lettuce, celery, different things like that, that customers want fresh and crisp, I'm able to do that. Competition from supermarkets, produce auctions, other farm stands. Those are all things you need to look at when looking at your community and trying to figure out what you can sell. Who are you selling to? What's preferred? We're going to talk about this. What will people pay in relation to how much does it cost to grow is another thing to consider. So how do you figure this out? How do you put all this together? How do you look at your community, say Corning, New York, um, or Manhattan, or um, Antwerp, New York, the little village that I live near? What are the demographics of that community and what are those customers looking for? Here in Watertown, I, I complain constantly that we don't have a Costco. I really like Costco. 
Costco only locates in communities that have certain demographics. So if the income levels aren't high enough, they don't locate there. Their business model does not fit that. So as a market gardener, you have two choices. If you want to grow certain items at a certain price point, you need to find a community and relocate to, the, to that community such that that community can buy things at that price point. So if you want to sell the $3 head of garlic, then you probably need to look at selling in Manhattan or the Syracuse Central Market or something like that. Um, because you're probably not going to get that at a very small local community market. If you are insistent upon selling close to where you live, then you need to understand the demographics of that community. So this could be income levels. The Watertown Saturday Farmers Market, which I'll refer to again and again, because it's where I sell, and I can use that as an example, um, is surrounded by low-income housing projects with a lot of elderly and handicapped residents. So one of the things that I have to determine when I plan what to grow is what are those buyers willing to pay for and what are they looking for? Housing characteristics feed into this. So those particular growers or buyers, um, they don't have big kitchens. They're living in tiny apartments. So a giant butternut squash or a huge watermelon when they come rolling up to my farm stand in a wheelchair and they're taking it back two blocks away or three blocks away to their tiny kitchen in their, their small apartment, they're not gonna buy a butternut squash or, or whole size watermelon. So I have to grow honey nut squash, which are small enough for a single dinner that they can eat that day. They basically buy what they, they need for the week. Um, so those housing characteristics can feed into it. Someone who lives in Clayton, New York, so those familiar with Jefferson County, uh, Clayton is a tourist town on the water, a lot of higher incomes, and people tend to buy in bulk. They'll buy large quantities, so they might be able to sell um, a, a nice pint of strawberries for eight bucks and, and be able to do that. So those housing characteristics of those demographics make a huge difference. Cultural identity is another thing that feeds into this. I cannot sell bok choy to save my life. The neighborhood I'm in, there, no one grows or eats bok choy. I have a lot of people from here in Jefferson County who grow up here and there are certain foods they eat, but Asian greens are not among them. If I go to Syracuse, on the other hand, to those markets, that's going to be a, something I really need to think about because there are a lot of people looking for different things, looking for ethnic products, whether that be Hispanic foods, Asian foods, um, Middle Eastern, sumac, for example. Um, sumac, you could probably sell just fine at the Syracuse farmer's market, but I doubt you would sell that here. Education. So people that are higher educated, that maybe they're more health conscious or uh, they have an interest in different cultures, things like that, they may be the market for ethnic foods. Maybe they, they want to experiment. They want to learn more by tasting and finding those things out. Different interests, occupations. Uh, so I sell to a lot of nurses and doctors for some reason who come to the Saturday market. And that particular consumer is very interested in health conscious decisions and foods that are grown without pesticides using organic practices, but they don't care about organic certification. So knowing who your customers are is critical to being able to sell and, and figuring out how to market to them. These demographics feed into some other things too. Um, the price points that you, you set things at. So maybe you have customers that just want basics, uh, the meat and potatoes crowd that they're going to buy potatoes and they want plain white potatoes and they want them in five gallon sacks um, or five pound sacks, I should say. Um, we kind of talked about European, Asian varieties, that sort of thing. 
the skill and preparation, if you're next to a college campus um, and you want to sell, I don't know, wheat lacoche, which is um, corn smut fungus, which is edible and delicious, um, they're you're not going to sell that very well in your college campus, even if there is an interest, although professors may buy it, people with departments, the college crowd may not have a place to cook it. So maybe they just want salad greens and lettuce. So level of convenience plays into this. If you're in a busy working community, um, how you package thing, timing of sales, day, night, weekend, um, the Watertown Wednesday market that we have here, which is run by our local chamber of commerce, the customer base for that differs significantly from the customer base for our Saturday market. And that's because one's during the week, one's on the weekend. We see Fort Drum people at the Saturday market, which we don't see at the Wednesday market typically, um, or maybe not in as large a numbers. We see more professionals at the, the Wednesday market. Um, all of these factors, by the way, are things to think about when selecting a farmer's market or a location to sell at. Um, what do you want to grow? What do you plan to grow? And will you have the right kind of buyer to pick to, to sell to? Someone willing to pay the money for that. Um, increasingly convenience is part of this pickup delivery, uh, whether people are familiar with certain items. So Celeriac, I've had to work pretty hard to get people to try that because they, they have no idea what it is. Um, and that will impact your sales. So in some neighborhoods, I could probably get $5 for a, a nice head of celery act. In my particular market, I sell it for two, three dollars just to get people to try it because otherwise they'll, they'll never experience it, which is very cheap, by the way. It's a loss leader. We'll talk about that in a minute. So any, any questions on kind of demographics and thinking about who your customer is? So the next step in, in planning is thinking about your customer's values. Um, your biggest competitor is going to be the big box stores who increasingly today have wonderful produce sections with organic products competitively priced against farmer's markets. And these big box stores are not to be ignored. They are your competition. Um, busy consumers expecting them to go out of their way to stop at your farm stand, to support your small business, things like that. All of those are ideal and wonderful things to think about. But at the end of the day, people's time and the convenience factors into it. Big box stores have a definite advantage over local growers. So what else does your customer value and how can you draw people to your farm stand? So ripeness, quality, and flavor are obvious things. Those, if you poll buyers nationwide at farmers markets, they tend to be what people say brings them to farmers markets. So you need to make sure that when you sell strawberries, that they're super fresh and that they're super ripe so that people will come to you. They'll go out of their way. They'll skip the big box store and they'll come looking for you for that. Freshness and increased shelf life. Uh, People want things picked right out of the field. Shelf life is important too. Um, so the strawberries on the left, if they put those, were to put these in the refrigerator, they look like this picture after a day or two, they're probably not gonna buy from you again. So that's a huge consideration as a market gardener. If you expect a premium for your product, the customer wants it fresh. Um, they, they want that quality. If they're going to go out of their way, you have to deliver on that promise as a local market gardener. Variety is another thing. Um, depending upon your market, some consumers value variety. Some don't, though. Um, you, again, need to know the demographics of your area. If you are in a meat and potatoes type community, where people want red tomatoes, sweet corn, and, and white potatoes, that is probably what you're going to have to specialize in. Um, you can try and introduce different foods to those folks, but you're going to have a harder time selling that. There is an increasing movement to support small local businesses. Um, 
I don't know that that's as huge a driver as we small business people want it to be, but it is out there. Environmental concerns are another thing to think about. So many people are going to farmers markets because of the environmental impact, the carbon impact of having foods brought in from California um, or buying things in plastic. So if when they go to the market, if that is your consumer, maybe you're in a college town where that's the number one priority for people and your strawberries appear in plastic clamshells, there's a good chance the consumer won't buy them because that's not their value. You probably want fiber paperboard clamshells instead. Um, and I've seen this. I've seen this quite often where the choice of your packaging at a farmer's market will make a huge difference. One of the huge things that I hear from consumers quite often is they want to know how things are grown. So maybe they're not worried about organic certification, though some customers are, and some customers know that difference. Um, but many consumers are interested in, in talking to you, looking at you in the eye and saying, how did you grow this? And you need to have a, a straight and honest answer with them. For example, I use sustainable practices. I, I don't use synthetic fertilizer or synthetic pesticides pesticides, but I do use chemical fertilizers. And I tell my customers that, and they're, they're fine with it. Um, many are happy that I'm, I'm using fertilizer to, to bring them a nice product. Um, convenience is another factor. If the only thing you are selling your product in is in a five pound bag and they want it in a one pound quart box or something like that, um, and they could go to Walmart and get that smaller size or another big supermarket. That may be one reason they're not buying your products. So find out what the demographics are for your customer. What are the things that they're looking for? And as a market gardener, as you plan for the season, um, keep those considerations in mind as you're determining what to grow how much to grow, how you're going to package it, how you're going to present it, et cetera. Any questions? So the next thing when you're talking market gardening is in this planning phase of what should I grow is to determine your timing. Um, what to grow is important, but also when to grow it is equally important in market gardening. There are things that people want all season, typically, although every market is different. And then there are things with a very short window of demand. Um, during strawberry season, what is something that people typically want? Rhubarb. If you don't have rhubarb on your stand during strawberry season, well, you, you lost a sale. Uh, people typically expect those two things together. If you try to sell rhubarb in the middle of the summer, you're going to have a tough time, though you'll sell some. Rhubarb in the fall, though, may be a good bet because it goes pairs well with apples. So there are seasonal demands and preferences with consumers that need to go into your planning um, as you figure out what to grow for a season and when to offer it. So some staples, lettuce, broccoli, onions, tomatoes, carrots, uh, they're going to sell routinely every week, and you need to plan such that you have those every week. If you don't have lettuce on your stand, and you're a lettuce grower, um, you need to, to really find a way to make that happen every week out of the year, because you're going to get repeat customers who are going to come back every week to you, and they're going to expect some sort of salad green from you. It may not be the same variety, but they're going to expect to have greens present and that's going to be a staple for you. I find that broccoli is that way, carrots, beets, kale. Um, I have people that come to me every week to buy kale for me, bundles of kale. And it kind of, kind of amazes me how I, I love kale, but I'm not sure I want it every single week but I do have customers that do that. And that expectation is there. So incorporating 
early, mid, and late season varieties is important, um, as well as succession planting for certain things. So cauliflower is a great one to do early, mid, and late season varieties, um, and maybe then do a mid season sowing to replace it. Succession planting is another consideration, things like radishes. Every three, four weeks, plant radishes to make sure you have them, or maybe even every two weeks, depending upon how much you plan to sell. Uh, cilantro, lettuce certainly is, is basically every week for me, I'm putting a little bit of lettuce out. Um, beets, summer squash is, is something that I have considered succession planting for. Um, by midsummer or late summer, my summer squash is looking terrible due to pest issues or whatever. And I've considered just planting a second batch in a different part of the garden to deal with some pest issues on a timing basis. Um, because interestingly, in my particular market, and this is where you know your market, the other growers tend to run out of summer squash in late August, early September. So if I were to succession plant later, I would have a captive market for selling that. Seasonal buying preferences are another consideration. Spring mix and early spring. So there's light, delicate greens to go with those early radishes um, versus romaine to go with those hearty beefsteak tomatoes in summer. Carving pumpkins. Now, when you think about Halloween pumpkins, you think you want to target Halloween for that. Again, think about the consumer. Most consumers are buying them before Halloween. So this is late September and early October. So they can sit on their porch. So the kids can play with them, whatever. That's the peak buying season for carving pumpkins. Heirloom pumpkins, beautiful squash, table decoration type stuff. That tends to do better, at least for in my particular market, towards Thanksgiving in the very late markets. So not as many people buying carving pumpkins on Halloween, but they're buying the really pretty pumpkins, um, some of the blue ones and the fancy ones to use in tablescapes, as well as for baking and cooking. So those are, are seasonal issues to think about. If you have access to a winter or an early spring market, think about storage crops as well. So right now I am planning for sales of storage crops in October at our farmer's market, but also those same storage crops will be sold again in June of next year. So right now I'm planning for June of 2023. I'm thinking about what crops I will grow this summer, hold through the winter so that I have them available next year. In my root cellar at the house, I have potatoes. I have, still have some winter squash. Um, the, the ubiquitous celery act that I grew too much of. And uh, some other things that I'll, I hopefully, if I store it correctly, will have available for our June market when there really is very little available at a typical farmer's market. So plan right now for next year's early markets with those storage crops. So let's talk income. So the other facet of doing this um, in your planning considerations, as you think about what you're going to, to grow, how much you're going to grow, um, the, the issue of money comes up. You, you need to plan things that are profitable. Is this a side gig for you or is this something you're planning as a primary operation? If your goal is to make money, then you need to know your costs. And we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, scale matters when you're selling low value, low cost vegetables. You can spend all day at a farmer's market, at a small market like the, the Saturday one that I sell at. And so I sell all summer. I maybe sell 8,000 a summer because I love doing it, I'm not really trying to make a living off of it because obviously I have a, a day job here at Cooperative Extension, which limits how much time I can put into it. Um, so for me, selling at this inner city market is cool and fun, and I meet lots of people and, and uh, I make a little bit of side money for it. 
if you need to make a living off of this though, you really do need to rethink how you're going to do it. And that typically means either getting bigger or selling higher value items at a larger year round market, the Syracuse Central Market, New York City, Albany, thing, locations like that. In those cases, you might be able to make a, a living wage, but you'll need those $1,000 a market markets to do that. A little village farmer's market where there are three vendors and 200 customers, you're not going to make a living off of that. Um, and then finally, the different scale of, of market gardening, if you really want to set your eyes on making money, um, you need to, to plan on getting bigger and going into wholesale. So I know of one onion farm that uh, is selling to regional produce buyers and supermarket chains, and their gross revenues are a million dollars. To do that, they have to hire employees, do different things like that. So as part of your business planning, these are the things you need to think about and scale. The other thing I want to refer you to is the study from uh, Pennsylvania, uh, PasaFarming.org, where they looked at market gardeners. And I always present this, and I'm so glad these statistics are actually out there, th to give people a wide-eyed view of what they're getting into so that they can clarify themselves what their plans are, what their goals are. Uh, so if, if you just want a little side money, great. If you want to make an income, great. Um, but you need to, to think about that in advance because you will need a certain scale of business to get there. About three and four direct market vegetable farms in the, the region the study looked from, from Virginia up through southern New York State, so most of Pennsylvania, they surveyed different firms. They found about three and four of them, their gross revenues were below what would constitute a living wage. And most of the farms there, most vegetable growers had off farm incomes. Those that had a living wage, the, the remaining roughly 25% were typically larger or diversified operations. Um, I, I'll send this link out, but I definitely would recommend if you're interested in market, market gardening to look at the economics of it, this will give you some some idea of what is happening at a national level and the how much money that you could potentially make from doing so. Uh, kind of a, a real-eyed view of it versus the rosy-eyed view that we often get. So what you can sell profitably is, is one thing. You got to be able to sell it at a profit. You have to be able to make more money than you put into it, and you have to be able to sell enough of it to justify your time. Sitting at a farmer's market for six hours, many people would be very unhappy if they didn't walk away with, with at least $500 in sales or something. Um, we have farmer's markets in this community. And unfortunately, we have way too many of them. They seem to be popping up like mushrooms that I've talked to growers who were lucky to sell $100. And that's that's not a great situation for six hours of work, not to mention the time to grow the vegetables. So that is something to think about. What can you sell profitably? The second question when it comes to planning, so thinking methodically about how you're going to go about becoming a market gardener and, and putting a crop out there is what you can grow, what's practical, what's feasible. So right place, right plant. Um, here in Northern New York, we are zone four uh, and I think in my neck of the woods, actually zone three at times I've seen too many 40 below days to reminds me when I lived back in Alaska. So we're not going to grow peach trees here. Um, that's just simply not going to happen. I might be able to, to eke some out and coddle them and find the perfect space, but to profitably grow peach trees, I simply have the wrong climate. I'm just not going to do it. So it's not worth my time to invest in trying to grow peach trees. Uh, know your, your climate zone, first of all. Um, you have to have the space to grow it too. 
So if you are on a half acre lot in an inner city neighborhood, peach trees probably aren't a good choice either. You simply can't get that many trees in a small lot to make it profitable. Um, versus where I'm at, I've got lots of land, more land than I can use. Uh, and I'm thinking about an apple orchard to, as a way to use that land in a U-pick operation because of that. Um, really, your space will determine what's practical and what can be grown there. Know your soil. So what's your soil pH? If you're here in Jefferson County and you're on a soil that is um, highly alkaline, then blueberries probably aren't a good choice for you. Um, they're just going to struggle. You can grow them, but you have to use drip irrigation with sulfuric acid or do raised beds or some workarounds. So you're going to work a bit harder versus somebody growing honeyberries, which do wonderfully here and uh, taste great. Unfortunately, not many people know what honeyberries are, so they're a tougher sell. But as far as what you can grow, honeyberries would be a choice. The marketing question is a different thing, but this, this should be in the, uh, the mix. Soil type and drainage. So I'm in clay soil. I have trouble with carrots. Um, my customers, by the way, everyone, every market should have carrots. Carrots always sell. I've yet to see farmers markets where at least a few people weren't buying carrots. Um, but I have trouble growing them. So I tend to leave those for other growers to take care of for that particular market. Sun exposure, acreage, a small urban lot is going to be very different from uh, 30 acres versus 300 acres. Um, if you just bought land and it's not been farmed for a while, you may approach that differently from um, a forested lot, which maybe you're going to grow some shade loving species, uh, wild onions, ramps, um, ferns, even brackens for uh, fiddleheads, that kind of thing. Another question about what you can grow is related to water. Um, in most of New York State, we do get reasonably good rainfall. Um, in fact, in some years, too much rainfall. If you don't have access to water, though, that's going to be a concern. Um, if you're in a hot location and you're relying upon municipal water, that can get expensive very quickly. So you may want to rethink about growing crops that are a bit more tolerant of dry conditions and dry spells if you don't have that irrigation. So may, lettuce may not be the right thing for you because lettuce needs regular and consistent water. Um, well water is a, a great source. Surface water is another one. Uh, food safety regulations play into some of those. And we'll, we'll talk about the Food Safety Modernization Act towards the end. Fertility, uh, before you do anything with market gardening, get a soil test, find out what the fertility is and correct it to fit the crop that you're growing or know if it can even be corrected. So like I mentioned with blueberries, you can add soil amendments, but at some pH levels, it's just not practical. Um, so you wanna know that before you jump in and go planting five acres of blueberries. The availability of compost and manure can be an issue. On my farm, I'm very lucky that I have an ample supply of uh, manure and other wood chips, things like that. Um, you may or may not have that. That's going to affect your gardening style and what you can grow. Um, sweet corn doesn't require, requires nutrients, so maybe a synthetic fertilizer, but not necessarily compost or manure, whereas other methods, depending upon if you're doing hotbeds, things like that, maybe you're going to need that. Interestingly, inner cities can have large quantities of compost at times. Um, think of all those coffee shops and restaurants with food waste or the trade trimmers who need a place to get rid of their wood chips. Um, surprisingly, that those sources prove to be quite valuable to people growing in urban environments. There are other limits to, to what you can 
grow that you need to think about in your planning process. So what equipment do you have or what equipment would you need? And do you have the money to buy that equipment? Um, are you going to work with just hand tools? So that will limit the types of crops you might want to deal with. If you have a tractor and implements, um, that'll affect the scale of what you're growing. Maybe 10 acres of sweet corn is a good proposition. Um, in that case, irrigation is another thing. Season extension is something I struggle with myself. Do you have a greenhouse? Uh, grow lights. Can you grow your own starts? If not, then you may want to look at things that can be direct seeded as, as what you're going to grow instead. Um, if you can't get them cost effectively either, if you go to your local nursery and a six pack of, of uh, lettuce is five dollars, well, you're not going to make a lot of money on that. So you really need to look at ways to seed your own lettuce starts and get started. If you want to do that early lettuce, you're obviously going to need a greenhouse or something, a cold frame at least, to get that started in. I personally don't have a greenhouse. I rely upon a cold frame and hot beds, which are cheap and old school methods. I use a lot of row covers too. I touched on refrigeration earlier. Um, refrigeration can determine what you can grow as well. If you don't have refrigeration, that means delicate greens, uh, baby lettuce, cilantro, um, butterhead lettuce, things like that, you will have to harvest those the morning of the market, cross your fingers and hope they last through the day. Um, you really need to get those chilled quickly and completely so that they'll hold at the farmer's market and then just put out what you can sell at a given time. If you don't have refrigeration, those type of delicate things are probably left best left to other growers. So that's a planning consideration to think about in advance. Labor. Labor is another concern in planning. So, so all the tasks that go with gardening, they, your cost, your labor is a cost. It's your time, it's your energy, it's effort that you could put towards your family, towards your primary occupation, whatever the case may be. Your labor has a cost to do all of those steps. And you need to ask yourself what you are capable of actually doing. Um, if you're planting a small market garden on an acre and you are going to use primarily hand tools and manual methods of weeding and bed preparation and things like that, are you physically able to do that? I'm not in the best of shape, so I typically get the, the rototiller out quite a bit, um, although I have experimented with some no-dig techniques because of that. So what are your physical limits? Um, do you know how to use a tractor if you had one? Um, that's something, can you get family members to help? If you have a large family, uh, weeding can be a lot easier than working as a one person. When are you available? So I know several market gardeners who are teachers and uh, they teach obviously during the school year and they take the time off during the summer to sell at the, the farmer's market. Um, which is a pretty good way of using your time. The question of hiring an employee is an important one too. So as you think of your planning, your business planning, many people say, I will absolutely not hire an employee. I'm not interested in it. Most of the larger market gardens do employ one or two people to help out seasonally. Um, this is not something to be undertaken lately. It needs to be done within the legal requirements of New York State. And you need to be, be very precise and specific about what you're going to have those employees doing. That is an investment of funds and you need to have a return on that investment. So for every hour that this person works growing lettuce, you need to have a X percent return on that. So again, this gets back to knowing your cost and how much labor and time is going into it. Uh, would you be a good supervisor? 
Um, can you do the paperwork and benefits? If the answer to that is no, then you may want to make sure that your garden is such of a scale that you don't need to hire people. If you're planting that million dollar market garden with 100 acres of onions, then all of those business practices are things that need to, to be accounted for in advance. There are some cases where you can contract specific tasks. So maybe you bring someone in with a, a tractor to do your springtime plowing. Uh, you get five acres plowed and then, then you do the manual labor on top of that. There are other ways to deal with those labor issues. So that, those are things to think about in, in planning and finding that niche on figuring out what am I gonna grow? So what can you sell profitably? What can you physically grow within your labor constraints, within the climate and the considerations of where you are located? Now, this is where this third question is where we get into a little soul searching. And I find that people have the most difficulty with the question of what do you want to grow? Because even once you limit these two other things to find that magic in the middle, that still can be a pretty large list of things, berries, uh, tree nuts, vegetables, um, even the difference of deciding to do a high tunnel with tomatoes in it. I hate growing, uh, I hate tying up tomatoes. So that's, that's one thing that's pretty easy for me to decide that I'm not gonna do is high tunnel tomatoes as an example. So this is where you really need to do the soul searching and figure out what do you like growing and harvesting? Is organic your thing? Is it sustainable? Um, do you like doing that handwork or is it gonna be a drudgery for you? Um, do you prefer using a tractor? If that's the case, a larger parcel might make sense. Monoculture or diversified farm. I get bored growing the same thing and I could never ever be the person growing 100 acres of onions. It's just not gonna happen. Um, think about that as you plan your season and you plan your farm long-term. So be, think both short-term and long-term about this. Uh, do you wanna do this seasonally? Are you, are you happy to have winters off or would you prefer to be doing something in the garden year round? Um, high tunnels, I know people that have spinach here in Jefferson County in February when there's two foot of snow on the ground and they actively sell spinach. Over in Essex County, we have a lot of growers that do that. And Essex actually has a winter farmer's market where that's a possibility to sell at. So ask yourself that question. Is it something you want to do year round and how can you facilitate that? Perennial, annual, tree foot, tree fruit, um, growing apples is very, very different from growing squash, obviously. And there are different skills that go into it. Um, I like pruning apples and I probably will continue planting an orchard for that reason because I find it to be a calming activity. Don't like doing it with tomatoes for some reason, but, but apple trees are different. I think it's because it's winter time when you're pruning. Um, hand harvest, machine harvest, delicate tasks versus speed. Yes, and we will be touching on CSAs when we, we get through this further, Shanika. So ask yourself, what do you love doing? If money were not an issue, as you're planning your farm, as you're planning your market garden, what would you be doing? And then find where those three questions come together. And that is what you need to be growing. That's the question. It's not an easy question to figure out. Um, what do you show off proudly to the world? Um, are you perfectionist? or is good enough. I'm a good enough gardener and that's why I like growing different things. Um, I couldn't be the person trying to do a hundred acres of perfect onions selling into wholesale, which requires doing the same thing repetitively again and again. So think of your goals, what values you bring to the firm as you do this planning 
process and, and do this process, put it all together. So as you're looking at market garden, the first thing you want to do is a business plan for your firm. You need to figure out who that customer is. And we're going to talk different sales outlets to include CSAs, how to sell the quantities, expected pricing, um, harvest and packaging needs, budget, competitors, and a SWOT analysis. Just like a regular business plan, you're going to look at strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. For a, a specific growing season, you need a growing plan. What are you going to grow that year? What are the rotations and successions? When do you need to have things in the ground? So I do a spreadsheet of what I'm going to grow when, and I refer to that through the season. It, it's important because if I go to a farmer's market and I don't have onions, and I always sell onions, it's money lost. Um, last year, for example, I went through my records. I saw the many times that I ran out of onions, and the, on those days, I could have easily doubled my sales just because I didn't plan properly for the season. So do that calendar with the planting dates. Make sure you get the quantities of seeds and transplants that you need um, and have a plan for accomplishing that. So we've talked planning, which is a huge part of being a market gardener. Make, to make sure that you have the products that people want to buy when they want to buy them at the location they want. We're next gonna go into growing, then we'll talk about, about harvesting and selling. Now, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on growing. Virtually all of the workshop that Cornell, workshops that Cornell does, all the technical workshops talk about this and it is subject specific. So what I do wanna to touch on is just the fact that growing at a market scale is different than a home garden. So this photo to the left is a lettuce uh, patch, <laughs> acreage. And uh, this is a commercial grower growing at scale to supply into the wholesale system. So there's probably $10,000 in lettuce in that field. If you're a home gardener, you're going to have a couple little tiny rows. Um, when you're growing at these large scales, you need to plan for efficiency and specialization with your tools as well. So this scale, he needs basket weeders that he puts behind a tractor, um, tractor type operations. Different methods that are out there, some things I'll refer you to do. There are different Cornell growing guides, soil preparation, tillage, um, thinning, trellising, all of these things can be found in technical details. Uh, the bottom line is for commercial horticulture, you do need to find the correct Cornell Growing Guides or Penn State's another great resource um, for growing at scale. The guides are going to be very different and much more detailed than what you would get in a home garden. They're going to go into pest control methods, commercial herbicides that may legally be used by certified pest operators if you choose to go that route. Um, those are all things that need to be addressed in advance of the season. The key thing, though, that keeps coming up in regard to market gardening is the need for standardization. So home garden, you have a little rake, a couple shovels, whatever the case may be, and you use them for a lot of different things. You may use the same tool for your tomatoes as you do for your um, radicchio that you do for your apple trees. When you get into market gardening, the bigger you get, the more specialized the tools that you're going to get. Even a one acre urban market garden, there are special tools designed for that type of operation that you should be familiar with, that you should be using. Um, so in the left, well, I guess the center image is a uh, seed bed roller. And that's a scaled for three foot beds in a typical urban market garden. The rake on the right uh, from Johnny's is another one that's scaled as a hand tool to be used in these larger beds. Um, 
the Tillmore tractor in the lower left is for somebody with like 20 to 30 acres, maybe, who's done, doing a truck patch and you've got five acres of greens or something that need to be cultivated in a specific way. So this particular tool is a belly mounted uh, basket weeder that goes between this perfectly spaced row. So you gotta have the right equipment to plant it and pulls those weeds out. Now, how many of you want to be the person hand weeding five acres of lettuce? Not me. These kind of tools provide you the efficiency that you need to, to make a profit on them. Because the, the labor otherwise will eat you alive, undermine your profitability, and turn what is potentially income into an expensive hobby. So we kind of talked about timing already, um, some other things to think about. Uh, don't delay harvest when you're a market gardener. Things are ready when they're ready. Um, if you let cauliflower go a day or two, it won't be saleable. Um, it'll be too far past. So when you go out in the field and you see that it's ready, it needs to be harvested, which means the timing for growing it needs to be planned carefully so it coincides with your market. Uh, one of the things that I cussed under my breath about this past year was, was this was the first year I did oyster mushrooms. Uh, so those are actually grown a lot differently from most regular crops. And they're a little bit unpredictable. Um, I went out the morning of our farmer's market and they were just beginning to pin, which is where they, they start poking out of the, the buckets and, and saying, I'm, I'm gonna be a mushroom. The next day, the mushrooms were this big, the Sunday after the farmer's market. And so I had basically a couple hundred bucks worth of oyster mushrooms that I couldn't sell. So that timing is something to think about carefully. Refrigeration can help that um, and extend those, those harvest windows. Um, if you don't have refrigeration and ways to hold plants, you may be losing uh, produce to, to basically bad timing in many cases. Uh, cold season and warm season crops, um, as you plan through the season, you need to plan a little bit differently depending upon when you're expecting to harvest. So fall crops, as we lose daylight, things grow slower. Uh, so even things are like cabbage or brassicas that are highly uh, frost resistant. Once we get into October and November, the day length gets so short that regardless of the temperature, they're just going to slow down. Elliot Coleman's book, which I refer to in, at the end, talks about this in great detail. So for planting of a fall crop, you need to include additional time, growing time to account for that short day length. Um, there are a lot of articles at Cornell about this, um, season extension, those sorts of things on, on doing that as a market gardener. And these are all technical issues that I don't want to get into too heavily here so that we can talk about CSAs and the other fun stuff. Weed control is another thing that you need to plan for. Uh, this SARE guide, I highly recommend this just came out this year. Great guide, but, but the bottom line is Make sure you have a plan for weed control. It should include catching weeds at the cotyledon stage when they're just coming out of the soil using the simplest methods possible, ba basket weeders and those sorts of things. Um, once they get bigger, they begin to compete with your crop and they're harder to remove. So different methods of doing that, seed bank management, crop rotation, mulching, occlusion, tarping. I'm a big fan of tarping. Tarping is wonderful, a great way to control the seed bank and to hold soils until you're ready to plant them. Pest management is another thing to, to talk about. In my experience, most buyers won't touch produce that has been damaged by pests. There will be exceptions, but it tends to be a hard sell. Um, I had some beautiful Chinese cabbage that had unfortunately had a couple bugs in it. And this uh, one wonderful Korean lady who 
who came to the market a couple times. Um, she came back the following week after she found some. She was not happy, but she was polite. And she gave me a lesson on how to, to properly clean them down the cabbages until uh, there was no visible sign of the insect damage or the actual insects in this case. So, so buyers pay attention to this closely. It does bother people quite a bit. Um, there are a lot of technical issues with this that I'm not going to talk about. Um, but whether you're organic or conventional, your planning process should include dealing with that. So that's all we're going to talk about growing. Harvesting. So the day of harvest with a farmer's market is a lot different from a home garden. Um, because you're harvesting such large quantities, many newbies underestimate the amount of time that it will take to get that much stuff cut, packaged, boxed, and in the truck to go to that farmer's market. Harvesting takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of effort, typically in a short time period. So you need to plan for that and have everything you need ready to go. So have your containers, the totes, basket bins, clean and sanitized before your farmer's market date, um, before the harvest. Make sure you designate for food safety purposes which ones go in the ground versus the ones that are going on top of the table for sellable products, the food safe ones. Plan where you're going to process and store the crops, your packing house. So regardless of the size of market you are, you're going to have to pack these up some way to get them into your vehicle to get them to the market or to get them onto your farm stand. You need a clean, well-lit location for doing that. Now, it can be outdoors. It can be a little table with a garden hose attached, or it can be a true packing house with a refrigeration attached and, and different things like that. But that should go into your planning. Um, ensure adequate time before your market. We kind of touched on that. Harvest and sequence related to how long things will hold in the field and your available storage. So I mentioned this before, if you do not have refrigeration and you're planning to sell lettuce, you're gonna be out there first thing in the morning to get it right before that market. Because if you get it the night before, it's, it'll wilt and probably will not be sellable at a farmer's market. As you get into August, the heat, dog days of summer, this problem gets even worse. Um, October, yeah, you can probably get away with it. Uh, cold October days, humid, not a big deal. But hot days in the summer, that lettuce is going to wilt pretty quickly. Hardier greens, the way I harvest those is I actually go in the field with a rubber band around my wrist, grab a bunch, fill it up with kale or whatever the case may be, and then pull the rubber round, band around it, and the toad it goes, done. Um, so I'm both bundling and harvesting at the same time. Berries can be harvested directly into paper pulp or plastic, plastic baskets. The idea in all of this is you want clean, attractive produce with a minimal amount of work and minimal handling. Um, berries, you don't want to wash them because they'll bleed and cause problems. So speaking of washing, do not display dirty produce. Um, I have gotten lazy and taken potatoes with dirt on them, for example. They don't sell. People simply will not buy dirty produce. It's just like the, the insects. There's a connotation that there's something wrong with it. So your produce needs to be clean and healthy looking when it gets there. Root crops, greens, brassicas, et cetera, really should be washed and any dirt and grime removed, any creepy crawlies removed, that sort of thing. Wash stations can come in many different forms. Um, they can be a simple sink and a drying rack like is shown here. Or I've even, one Amish grower, a friend of mine, he's got a commercial wash station, conveyor belt with scrubbers and all these fancy things that is powered by propane of all things. And I, I just kind of have to laugh at it because it's so anachronistic. Uh, Sanitation is a big concern with these two. Remember, this is food, particularly with greens and things that are eaten raw. Um, your surfaces should be kept clean and sanitized. So clean 
meaning the dirt has been removed, sanitized, meaning the bacteria have been killed. Um, washing produce in some cases does affect the holding time and may introduce bacteria. And there is a law now in effect that covers this, and this is known as the Food Safety Modernization Act. Uh, the Produce Safety Alliance out of Cornell University, they do teach an eight hour course for growers that addresses safe food handling requirements for those types of produce that are eaten raw. Um, I do recommend that if you plan to be a market gardener, particularly if you're selling leafy greens, things like that, that you do attend this course. It's available online or um, used to be you could only do it in person, but uh, they have allowed people because of the pandemic to do it online. And one of the things they cover in this, which I touched on is the difference between cleaning and sanitizing. Um, think about your your restaurant, um, if you see dirt there, you can't sanitize nasty crud. It, the crud has to be removed first, then sanitized, and then it's safe for food to touch it. The vegetables that you're growing, particularly berries, lettuce, those things that, are, that consumers will eat raw, those things need to be handled once they come out of the, well, from the field, to your wash station, to the farmer's market, they need to be handled as food. Um, so this is a critical issue. If you make somebody sick, your insurance company is not gonna be very happy with you. So let's talk about a harvest procedure, how you would go about doing this and handling something safely. And we'll use salad greens as an example. So if you have to harvest, uh, you harvest early in the morning when they're most hydrated, um, you cut, rinse them, trim them, um, trimming the lower leaves from heads if you're doing that, and you store them in sanitized totes and get them into your cooler immediately. Um, leaf lettuce and mescaline, this is an example of a cutting system that's automated. Um, this is powered by, I think this is the one that's powered by a drill. And so you just roll it down the row, you, cut stuff into a bag, take it back to your wash station, clean it and uh, bag, dry it, bag it up, get it into refrigeration and sell it. Um, there are specific steps with greens. If you're gonna do these type of baby greens or cut greens that you have to follow. Under food safety rules, raw agricultural products are differentiated from processed foods. So as a market gardener, when you sell washed bagged lettuce, you are still selling a raw product. You may not sell that as a salad mix ready to eat. Um, that would have to be processed in a 20C kitchen. That said, most consumers are going to use it that way. So under the Food Safety Modernization Act, you do want to take steps to remove dirt and debris. You want to rinse it in a second rinse to remove films. And then Cornell recommends sanitizing it with a product like Oxidate, which would be a third rinse to kill any bacteria. So you get rid of the dirt, you remove the films, and then you sanitize. Once you do that, most growers will spin the greens. Uh, they'll, some people will put it on a screen with a drying uh, fan on it to dry it out a little bit further before it goes into the bags. Um, the cut greens are sealed with, I used, uh, tape on mine, a little gizmo. I just twist the bag closed, tape it, and an automatic tape dispenser works like a charm to, to speed things up. And I sell quite a bit of greens this way. Um, the greens should be labeled with the name of the farm and the date of harvest, as well as I, I recommend adding the words raw agricultural product, wash before using, that sort of thing, so that consumers know that this is not something that they should just eat, that it does need to be further processed. There are legal reasons for doing this as well. Um, Cornell's got a great video at this link on a produce wash station that kind of walks you through this. Uh, if you go into market gardening, lettuce is profitable, and which is why I spent a little bit of time with it. 
Um, but these food safety steps on getting the product ready to sell become critical. And as you can see, all of this from harvest through packaging to labeling to getting it to the market take considerable time. And that needs to be factored into your planning. Storage and refrigeration is something that, that every commercial market gardener needs to, to take into consideration. Uh, this bullet bulletin basically gives you the information that's required uh, for warm storage items. Uh, don't store basil in a refrigerator, please. It, it will turn black on you. Um, to cold storage, things that need to be stored 32 to 40 degrees. With good storage, that few hour window for lettuce and other things can be extended to a week. And then as a market gardener selling, it becomes a lot easier to plan your entire week versus rushing around the night before the farmer's market, uh, trying to get things ready. So refrigeration can open up a lot of different avenues. There are different ways to do this for market gardens. Uh, coolers with ice packs are what I use to transport to the market. But when I hold stuff, I actually have some small, well, some, a couple of refrigerators because I'm selling a small amount. Um, most market gardeners these days are using a cool bot, which is a device that rigs an air conditioner to go below its settings. And this allows a an air conditioner to uh, cool a small room or something like that where vegetables are held uh, at length. Um, the more professional market gardeners I know that have these love them. And it's, I think, a, a great way to cheaply get a large area for refrigeration. Beyond that, commercial standalone walk-in coolers, trailer units and custom engineered built-in coolers. So the bigger you get, the more you need to think about refri re refrigeration from uh, a couple ice packs all the way through a built-in custom space to hold that valuable product before your market. Having that refrigeration saves you labor and time because you're not having to, to do stuff at the last minute. So let's talk selling units and packaging. So you got to know your market. What sizes do buyers prefer? My market, I've got a lot of seniors who live by themselves. So they want small, tiny packages for one. Um, even if I price it the same, they won't buy it because they don't like to waste things. So I can give them twice as much, but they're not going to take it. So I have to be very careful in my packaging to have small quantities for the, this particular customer base. So you need to know what your customers are looking for. If you're in August and you have customers that are planning to, we have a large Italian American community and we've got folks that want to can tomatoes and make sauce, they're expecting five gallon buckets or bushels of tomatoes, not a little pint. So you need to have it available in that size, priced with a quantity discount seasonally. Um, Let's see, the choice of packaging can make a difference in how you hold things, unvented bags, mushrooms and paper bags, that sort of thing. Um, plan to have rubber bands for the bundles. Um, if you do go into wholesale, and we're gonna talk about wholesale in a minute, then there are special produce boxes that are designed for that. They're industry standards that you should invest in. If you expect to sell to restaurants or wholesale into supermarkets, that sort of thing, these are, are not optional. They're basically a mandatory requirement. So legal requirements to sell produce. The sanitary regulations for direct marketing. Uh, this link is one that I highly recommend that you read. Um, this goes into the details on what's required. So to quote them, a license is not required to sell fruits or vegetables that have been grown and harvested, produce must be stored under sanitary conditions, having removed excess dirt. So they actually spell this out. So not only do consumers expect it, the state of New York does too. Produce may not be cut or processed at farmer's markets, except as part of a Department of Health permitted food service operation. So you can't even give samples of 
tomatoes or whatever the case may be, um, unless you have a 20C kitchen license, which is required for any type of value added processing. Foods are typically tax exempt, but cut flowers, nursery stock and other non-edible goods, you do have to charge a sales tax for those. Uh, if you need help figuring out how to do that, just call us and we'll help. Processed foods, like I said, require a license. And the only other thing to think about when selling is some town and villages have zoning requirements that you'll need to comply with. So if you do a farm stand, you need to make sure it's legal to do it. If you're in an agricultural area, um, you're probably just fine. And typically farm stands are regulated different from say a retail store or something like that. Pricing, uh, we've talked about covering your cost. Do not undercharge, this hurts others <laughs> as well as yourself at the end of the day. Um, I think this happens too often and a lot of people end up, we, we lose farmers as a result of it um, that would do well if they would just make sure that they, they price things according to what it costs them to grow it. Um, the season and variety will make a difference on this. So if you're trying to sell tomatoes for the same price that you're selling them in, in August for the same price that you sold them in, in June, that's gonna be problematic because August is your tomato season. So resources for pricing information, obviously check your competitors, grocery store websites. NOFA New York does have a price index that's worth looking at. Uh, it is based upon information provided by other growers and it's highly location specific. So be sure to take that with a, a grain of salt. If you see New York City prices and you're trying to apply that to Watertown, New York, food distributor pricing can be helpful. Helpful. The USDA specialty crop reports are particularly helpful when coming up with pricing. Produce auctions are another source of pricing information. And I think probably the best source because they give real time information on where things are growing. Uh, produce auctions are located throughout New York state. We've got a lot of vendors selling at them, but we've also got a lot of farm stands and, and markets buying from them. We have several here in Jefferson County that, that buy at Ithaca uh, or some of the, the Penyan produce auction, as well as Pennsylvania produce auctions and bring things into our county. Um, so that does factor into your pricing because your customers will in fact be comparing your prices to the same items that are brought in from auction. So farm stands, ways to sell. Farm stands are one. Um, many market gardeners swear by their own farm stand. They're pretty easy. These are temporary in nature. Basically, it's a sheltered location. It has to have good access for the customer, though. In most cases, the customer is going out of their way to find you. So if you're on a busy road or something and you've got an easy place to pull off, um, you'll probably do well with that. Um, a friend of mine has a great, what should be a great location that's on a wonderful, well-traveled road, but his driveway is narrow and hard to get into. And I think he loses business because of that. So it still has to be convenient. Uh, customers should feel comfortable pulling up to it, running into your stand, buying what they need and leaving. The great thing about farm stand is you can harvest what you need throughout the week. So you constantly refill these. You're not aiming for one set point in time. So when that cauliflower is ready, it goes on the stand and is ready for market. There are some pros and cons of doing a manned farm stand. Most of the ones that I've seen are on the honor system. You do need clear instructions for the customers uh, as to what they're supposed to do. People are unfamiliar with and uncomfortable with honor system stands and a few signs saying, come in, welcome, here's how to buy from me that are very clear and explicit can make a huge difference in the amount of sales that you're, you're doing. People feel like they're doing something wrong when they come in. Um, breaking bills can be problematic 
and result in lost sales. So you want your pricing to be in even numbers. You don't want people to have to make change. There is a potential for theft with firm stands. Uh, so maybe a camera with offsite recording. Generally, most doing this factor in their losses uh, as part of the business calculation. They just realize there will be some theft. Typically, it's not an issue, though I have talked to some farmers who refused to do firm, an honor system firm stand again because they were stolen from so badly. So I have heard very few, but a few people say that they won't do it. Um, so your mileage may vary. Scannable QR codes are increasingly common at farm stands, and it's something I highly recommend with Venmo, PayPal, that sort of thing. Um, some stands will put refrigeration on their stands so people can go in and buy that, that lettuce, that fresh bag of tender greens, broccoli, things like that. Broccoli is a great item to sell. Customers love it. Kids love it. But it goes bad at a farmer's market pretty quickly. So refrigeration is, is really critical, but it's well worth the investment of putting into it. This is a photo of the Watertown Saturday Farmer's Markets, Farmer's Market. Um, so this is the J.B. Wise Pavilion, and this is Gary up front, and my husband, Alan, is the next guy back. He's the, the guy with the hat. And um, so this is a typical inner city small market. Um, farmer's Markets are a great way to get started for beginners because it gets your name out there and the community you establish a clientele. I routinely have people ask me for my business card so that they can come to my firm stand and buy directly, which I actually don't have because I live in the middle of nowhere and would prefer people not come visit me. Um, but again, that's my personal preference and I'm, I'm very clear about that. So I love selling at the farmer's market. I, I think it's a great day. Farmer's markets are not for everyone. You do have to be sociable. You have to enjoy doing the selling. And uh, that's one of the pros for some people and cons for other people. Most farmer's markets do require insurance. And this is available in a couple different ways. Many farm policies include raw liability coverage for raw agricultural products. So remember I told you to put that on your label for the lettuce? There's a reason for that when it comes to your liability coverage. Farm insurance policies basically only are, they're used to traditional row crops and things like that. They don't quite know how to deal with this direct sales type stuff. Um, so that's one thing you do need to check to make sure that your farm policy includes this. If you cannot get a farm policy or maybe you're, you live in an urban environment, um, you can go through the New York State Farmers Market Federation and, uh, and obtain a policy through them. These are typically priced by the quantity of sales. So if you have $5,000 in sales, it's like 20 bucks for every thousand. So I don't know, a hundred bucks, whatever the case may be. Every farmer's market has its own rules. Some allow resellers, whereas others do not. You need to know this before you enter a market. If you will be upset that the person across from you is selling tomatoes from California at half your price, and that market allows that, that's probably not a place for you to be. Um, Look for those markets that suit your values and how you'll be growing. I attend this market because it's run by the growers. We enforce the rule that you have to grow what you sell, uh, except for strawberries or something, which you can bring in from one of your neighbors. So I do bring strawberries from an Amish neighbor to sell for him, and he gets all the money from it, though. I wish I could make a profit on it, but that's kind of the way that the rule works. The Wednesday market in Watertown has different rules. Um, the, the bottom line for all the rules will be New York State regulations on sanitation, safety, that sort of thing. But then additional requirements related to reselling, setup times. Um, if you can leave early, those sorts of things will be spelled out in the farmer's market. Farmers markets are a significant investment in time. Many growers don't like doing them. It takes time to get set up, to load in, load out. You're there for six to eight hours. 
You may or may not get sales depending on foot traffic. If it rains that day, you're going to see different things. If you have a market manager that isn't doing their job very well, or maybe a new market manager, and the advertising is bad, um, that can directly affect your sales. And, and there's not a lot of control over that in some cases. So choose your farmer's market well. Uh, rule of thumb, your seasoned vendor fee should equate to a day's sales. Um, so like the Saturday market, it's $225 for the season. And usually three, 400 bucks is what people sell. So that actually it's a pretty darn good market for the cost to invest in it. Um, now compared to Syracuse, it's pennies, not worth bothering with. Um, so definitely look at those fees and what you get for the, the amount of money that you're paying into it. I recommend that beginners do start at a smaller farmer's market until you know what you're doing though, um, because it is definitely a rhythm and planning and all these different things we've talked about that you, you have to, to really work on. Um, the downsides to farmer's markets are, again, timing, unpredictability. Um, in our area, because we only have seasonal markets, the first few markets of the year are terrible because buyers forget that there is a farmer's market and they're not habituated. So that's an issue. Um, holding things throughout the day and keeping them pretty can also be an issue because you don't have active refrigeration there. And so people want to see those greens. They want to see the broccoli. They don't want it if it's wilted, but you have to keep it pretty. So I use a mister, other methods. I rotate in and out of coolers to make sure that what I have on display looks good. So tips for the farmer's market, smile, be friendly, say hi to customers, greet people, uh, be neat and clean. You need to be neat and clean. This is people's food they're, you're dealing with. So they want to know that you're handling things respectfully and safely. Keep everything on tables. So if you have a cooler, people won't bend down and pull stuff out of a cooler. Even the table or the cooler needs to be on a table. Um, your display should be attractive and bountiful. So if you don't have a lot of one item, cheat it out, put some boxes or something in a basket to make it look like there's more there. Uh, studies have time and a time sh again shown that when things look bountiful, when there's a lot of it, that people tend to buy more. Uh, so you want your display to look like you're just overfilled and brimming with beautiful produce that will draw people to the, the display and they'll buy from you. Use multiple levels to help achieve this, but also so people can see everything when they walk up, if they're looking for certain items, um, a lot of times they'll glance right over them and not see them. So you wanna make sure, sure things are clear and visible. So different levels, just like any retail marketing environment helps that. Um, provide recipes for uncommon items. So that celery act I mentioned, I provide recipes on how to use it. And once I talk to people, I do the sales pitch, get them the recipe, they end up buying it. Um, attractive item signage with clear prices is essential today. Today's buyers do not like to haggle. They're used to supermarket pricing. They're embarrassed by haggling in most cases. They want to know how much things are without asking you. So make sure your signage is perfectly clear. Tell your story at the farmer's market uh, with colors, banners. Uh, make sure people can see and know who you are and what you're about. If you use organic methods, make sure that people can see that that um, that your values come across in that presentation, in that visual presentation that you put out there. So that could be signage in the background. It could be a lot of different ways of doing that. Um, have bags for the customers that need them to include clear produce bags. Be prepared for that. New York does have its bag law. So um, this is a more contentious issue, but the clear produce bags are exempt from that, but the larger shoppers bags are not. Um, so that is something that hopefully customers will have bags with them. What I do is I actually save uh, 
the uh, craft brown paper bags and provide those to customers for those that, that really need them. Generally, people, though, at my market do bring their own bags. It's Since the law was passed, we're seeing more and more people planning and bringing bags in advance. Other sales methods, online and delivery are becoming more and more frequent. So Rico rings is one thing that is kind of new. So basically one or multiple farmers take orders by a website, Facebook, or some other online application. People pay in advance, and then the grower sets a time and a place or growers where they're going to be at this shopping center parking parking lot Saturday at one o'clock uh, for one hour and buyers and sellers show up exchange goods and done no cash trades hands only the vegetables do that because everything's bought in advance um, I don't recommend doing cash on delivery if you plan to do this kind of model this has not been proven in the north country and I'm not aware of it anywhere else it is being done in other parts of the U.S., um, but it's coming out of Europe and it's quite popular in Scandinavia. So we'll, we'll wait and see what happens with this particular concept. Online ordering is some, something that some farms are tinkering with. I'm not sold on it yet, but there are a lot of technical and logistical issues with that. Um, I personally think it's going to be too expensive for most market gardeners to play with. CSA, so getting to your question, uh, CSA works by a buyer prepaying a share of that season's vegetables. So the, the concept behind that is the risk is spread between the consumer and the farmer. Um, basically, you sell that share and you agree to provide a weekly quantity of vegetables that are seasonally available every week to that particular customer. Some growers do allow customization of the, the boxes or the bags. Most don't because the customization can be pretty cumbersome. Got to remember that Joe likes red tomatoes, but doesn't like eggplant. And this person wants celery, but doesn't like onions or whatever the case may be, that kind of record keeping can be pretty tedious. There's some online software that accounts for that, but I don't recommend it um, unless you, you get to a certain scale. For a beginner, it's pretty tough. I would do, a, if you are interested in a CSA, um, I would do a basic CSA with you get what you get kind of thing. There are some nonprofit grants uh, out there that provide shares and CSAs to low-income consumers. We have some of this in Jefferson County, kind of a neat model. So you set up the CSA, you go to the nonprofit, and maybe you're in an inner city area where people don't have food access and you want to provide that. So you go to the nonprofits and say, hey, we'll provide these fresh veggies to this particular subset of customers. We just need some donations to cover it. So that's one way that a CSA can work in different types of communities. Um, CSAs require meticulous planning though. So a farmer's market, and I love doing farmer's markets for this reason, is if I run out of something and I go to the market, people will go, do you have this? If I say, no, I'm sorry, they don't get upset with me. In a CSA, if you have a box that is short one week, people are gonna be upset because they've already paid for that item. Um, so CSAs can be tricky. And before you jump into them, I would say get a couple years experience selling through a regular farmer's market so that you get these rhythms and timing down first before you jump into a full CSA type setup. A different option and kind of the, the similar alternative are subscriptions, um, basically where people can start and stop at any time that they want. Uh, so four weeks or $20 a week for as many weeks as you want is a, a different way of doing that. And I, I think that's going to catch on. I think that's becoming more popular. Um, 
the danger of that though is losing your customer base two thirds of the way through and then being stuck with a lot of stuff. Agritourism is something that forms a huge part of many market gardeners incomes. So if you have acreage, a beautiful location, it's definitely something worth thinking about. Uh, entertainment and hospitality are, are the focus in these situations. So you pick pumpkins going out for the day and, and picking that carving pumpkin on site, spend the entire day, um, less labor for you to haul pumpkins around the market, for example. Jefferson County, for example, lacks many, if any, you pick operations. Um, we have one pumpkin grower, and I think one person, one or two people doing blueberries. I think you pick is something that's ripe for picking. So uh, other add-ons that we see people doing with market gardens, corn mazes, photo selfie opportunities. So come buy your vegetables, come pick your vegetables and, and spend the day um, taking a selfie, let the kids play, get out on the farm, enjoy the, the space. Wedding venues are another thing that are particularly popular. Um, b, b rentals are another things. There are insurance considerations with agritourism. You need to make sure your insurance company is on board with it. Um, state law addresses this as well, and I can answer questions on the side about that. But increasingly, many market gardeners are turning to agritourism as a way to pad that bottom line to make a living wage, for example. Payment methods, so some of the logistics, if you are at a farmer's market, cash is critical. You need to make sure you have a lot of float to make change. Most people still deal in cash at farmer's markets, um, but this is changing. We're seeing more and more customers using credit cards, PayPal, Venmo, so if you post QR codes, particularly at market stands, these can work very well. And when you have these electronic methods, typically the sales are doubled or tripled because people don't tend to carry cash. And I've, I've seen this even at the farmer's market. If you are interested in getting a SNAP EBT reader, um, there are ways for farmers to accept SNAP at farmer's markets and at their farm stands um, or through CSAs, whatever the case may be. I can walk people through the market link grant, which provides funding for a um, Bluetooth reader that can be used to process SNAP transactions. Uh, the New York State Farmers Market Federation provides a grant to cover those fees in the second year. So two different grants, but basically there's no money out of pocket. It's just the, the, um, the time it takes to, to get the reader. And I, I don't see huge SNAP EBT sales at our farmer's market, despite the clientele that I have, but because I think most customers don't expect it, but that's, that is also changing. Market gardeners should definitely register for the farmer's market nutrition program and to accept Fresh Connect coupons. Um, these are sent to veterans and low income community seniors, handicap, whatever, um, five, 10, $20 uh, increments, but in $5 coupons, $4 coupons, I mean. And you have to be registered in advance to be able to accept the FMNP program coupons. Fresh Connect's a little bit different, but this is free. There's no charge to doing it, no reason not to. And I do quite a bit of sales through FMNP. Um, so definitely take the time to do this. Excess product, invariably, if you're a market gardener, you're going to have too much of something. Um, so lost leaders are one way to deal with this give people a good deal and hopefully they'll come back. There is a danger in doing this in that you may be training them to accept bargains. Um, another way, and I think this may be a better way to deal with this, are donation to food pantries. New York State offers a credit of 25% of the fair market value up to $5,000. So 25% tax credit is a pretty good deal. Um, just make sure you have the receipts and the paperwork 
to, to go with it. Different food pantries have different capabilities for raw products though, but most of them do appreciate vegetable donations. That value added products are another thing to think about. And I typically at smaller farmers markets don't see as much of this as I should. Uh, this is a good way to make money. It does require certain steps that you as a grower have to take as well as the time to actually make the product. So if you're going to do home processing, there are only certain types of things that may be manufactured in a home kitchen. You need to register with New York State Ag and Markets. It's got to be labeled with made in the home kitchen of blah, blah, blah. Um, and you have to stay within their very restrictive list of products that can be made. For example, if you're going to melt chocolate, you need a commercial kitchen. You may not melt chocolate in a home kitchen. Um, most products, though, do require a commercial license. We have several growers in Jefferson County. There's one fellow who's, who, for about 25000 put together a commercial kitchen who is now smoking and drying peppers and garlic powders and doing a pretty good business with that. Um, so he did obtain a 20C kitchen license, and he has an inspector come to that kitchen and look at it. But it's a really good way to transform that farm product, that raw product, into a value-added product that sells for a higher price. Many times, these are shelf-stable products that you can hold and sell in winter markets, those sorts of things. One thing I'll point out is that farm insurance policies as I said, typically only cover raw commodities, not value-added or packaged products. So you need to make sure your, your policy is amended to deal with these value-added products. So if you give somebody food poisoning, you don't want to go bankrupt in the process. Wholesale opportunities, produce auctions are throughout the state. Uh, other farm stands quite often will buy produce and resell it. Not everybody can grow everything. Um, I sell strawberries from my, my Amish friend, Eli. He grows them better. He's got the family members that can pick it. More power to him. Uh, restaurants are a place to sell. Food service distributors, supermarket chains, and other food processors are wholesale opportunities. But these do come with certain requirements. Um, you must be compliant with the Food Safety Modernization Act. Most commercial distributor, distributors will require good agricultural practice certification. And this is a formal audit process that somebody comes to your firm, they see what you're doing, and they check the block that you're not going to poison somebody with an unsafe food product, basically. Wholesale products typically have to be in perfect sizing. So this photo with the, the zucchini, the three different things, the bottom photo, the middle one, wholesalers would not accept the bottom or the middle photo, um, they're going to expect the one on the top. Um, you do need to meet those size standards and grading requirements for selling into the wholesale environment. So that's where that technical expertise and that very niche growing capability comes into play. I could never do that. I wouldn't want to do that. So that's something to think about. Restaurants can be a little bit different. They do require compliance with Food Safety Modernization Act requirements, um, but with increased interest in farm-to-table chefs are more willing to work with farmers, and uh, in some cases, even they're happy to receive the ugly, blemished fruit that maybe you can't sell at the farmer's market, but if they're going to make a sauce or something out of it, they don't care. They're, they're going to get a good product at a, at a better price. Um, we do have a guide to selling to restaurants. And it is something to think about. Not every restaurant is interested though. It is a very niche restaurant market and it's going to be those chefs who prepare things from scratch, um, who are willing to work with things that are less repeatable. Uh, if you go to a restaurant that has the same items on the menu every single week, 52 weeks out of the year, they're probably not gonna be willing to deal with you because they're buying the exact same items through food service instead. So I mentioned GAP certification. Um, these are audited by third 
third-party contractors. You do not need GAP certification unless you're going into wholesale. So that's one thing I really do want to stress. A lot of people get confused by that. However, you must comply with the Food Safety Modernization Act, which boils down to ensuring that any raw produce that you sell is free of contaminants. Um, there's a separate class on this that I encourage that you go and attend. The, uh, their record keeping requirements for covered growers with that. Um, if you fall in certain categories that deal with the dollar thresholds, uh, whether you ship out of the state, different issues like that, um, there some growers will be exempt, but larger growers must comply with the record keeping requirements. The eight hour course covers who is and who is not covered. If you don't know if you're covered, just ask your cooperative extension office and they can help you work through this. Um, but you do need to, to, deter, to determine if you are indeed a covered grower. So gap requirements deal with packaging, basically making sure that bacteria and things do not get on the food as it's processed. Um, if you're in the wholesale chains, they do require a lot of documentation. And that's one of the downsides to selling into supermarket chains and things like that. They want to be able to do a produce recall if something's contaminated. So you need to track things with meticulous records. And auditors look for this documentation. Um, the reason why is because of the amount of contaminants that we do see in our food system that supermarkets deal with and their insurance companies in particular deal with because they have to answer the, the bill when somebody is poisoned by that packaged lettuce with listeria in it. And certainly there are a lot of different things that do appear in fresh produce. So food safety is a paramount concern that you, you need to address and you need to deal with. Um, contamination can be spread from your fingers from soil amendments, putting manure on stuff. How many of you want manure on your fresh strawberries? Contaminated water, animals, uh, so a cat that defecates in a garden. Um, unclean processing surfaces. There were some cantaloupes about 10, 15 years ago that were contaminated with listeria from the packing house in Arizona where they were processed. All things to think about as a market gardener. So finally, I'm gonna leave you guys with this. Um, advertising is a critical concern for selling your produce. So if you've gone through the trouble of figuring out what it is to sell, done all the planning and everything, and nobody knows it exists, you're not going to sell it. People don't buy what they don't know about. So farmers markets are cool because if it's a good market, somebody else is handling that advertising. The community comes in, they find you, your sign is your advertising. Easy, right? If you are a CSA or a market stand, maybe you're off a main road, um, you need to, to find a way to let people know that you exist. They don't know you exist. They're not going to buy things from you. So signage, directional signage to your stand um, at the stand itself or in the farmer's market booth. You need to tell your story. People should be able to figure out who you are. Are you, do you do you use organic practices, conventional? Do you do grow interesting and exotic things, or are you a basic meat and potatoes type person? We talked about pricing. Um, where you advertise is important. So who's your ideal customer and where will they be? So if you're catering to busy moms, well, maybe flyers at a gym or a daycare would be a good choice. Traditional media is not great for market gardeners because of the cost, but it is an option. Typically, market gardeners are using digital uh, advertising, whether through social media like Facebook or uh, online ads, Google ads, for example. Social media presence, web pages are, are one way to do it. Having a business card is important, though. Um, like I said, I've been asked for a business card several times at farmer's markets, and it's kind of like, you want my business card? But, but have it available and, and you'll be surprised at the business you'll pick up. Um, so you advertise at the farmer's market and then they start coming to your stand. Press releases are a cool and free way to do it. A press release to your local media market that says open for the season 
or we just donated this to this food pantry are one way to get your name out in the public. Your county will have a local food guide in most cases. Um, Jefferson County certainly has one. This is a free listing that I highly recommend that you take advantage of. Uh, record keeping is, I forgot about the slide, um, is critical. You need to know what you grew this year, how much of it you grew and how much you sold. For example, last year, I didn't grow enough onions. I documented how much I took to the market and found out I sold all of them. So I'm doubling the number of onions I'm growing next year. If I didn't have those records, I may or may not have figured that out. Um, how much was wasted? How much was donated? How much did you use on the farm? Compile, compile your sales data to figure out what's most profitable for you and what's most popular. Um, where were your profit centers? So I spent Christmas, the day after Christmas, going through our records and going, okay, how much did we spend growing X, Y, Z? How much did we make on it? And are we going to do this again? So we actually spent some time looking through those sales records to determine what we are going to do in 2022. Food safety record keeping becomes important if you have to do a recall. Um, surveys of your customers can be important too. Sending out surveys, whether through social media. What do you want us to grow next year? CSAs, this is very important. Um, people like to be asked for their opinion and they like it more when you pay attention to it. Taxes uh, for the market gardener are always a fun topic. Um, we're all going through that right now, but Schedule F is what will keep profit or loss from farming for a market garden, just like any farm on Form 1040. So you need to keep a ledger with all your receipts, all allowable expenses, and your sales. Cash sales at a farmer's market or your farm stand can be recorded by the day rather than recording individual sales. Obviously, if you use digital sales, you'll have individual sales, but you can also just say we sold uh, $448 worth of vegetables at this farmer's market and use that as your, your document for that particular day. Um, real property tax breaks for agriculture are a concern. If you're a market gardener, you need to take advantage of these. Um, typically, this occurs when you're in New York State, exceeding 10,000 in revenue for 10 years. Um, food is exempt from sales tax, as I mentioned, cut flowers, non-edibles or not. So you need to make sure you have those sales tax records filed in advance if you are in those categories. Um, the sales tax that you pay when you buy items from your farm, just like any business, you should be exempt from these wholesale purchases. So when you buy your seeds, your soil amendments, things like that, file a New York state sales tax exemption form with that so that you're not paying that sales tax. That adds up pretty quickly. Um, the final thing, if you have good records, uh, between record keeping and your taxes, the sales data, not only do you need it for taxes, but if you do apply for grant opportunities, um, It'll really help to bolster your case in doing so. For example, in Jefferson County right now, there is a $10,000 grant that's being made available um, through from the Ag Development Agency and um, funded with COVID relief money for people that are doing food processing. Um, to have some data on what your farm has been growing would help you to get that $10,000 grant. So summary, focus on growing those items that you have an identifiable market for that actually will grow within the constraints of your farm, whether it's labor or the soil, whatever the case may be, and that you actually enjoy growing. Don't be miserable doing this. Um, understand your market before you plant anything. Have a business plan that includes a planting and harvest schedule, plan for pests and weeds, more importantly, plan for your harvest methods and your packaging because that's going to take more time than you think. Ensure that you have the right product and the right quantity, quality, when and where the consumer wants it. Stagger plantings to make sure you have a consistent supply. Good sanitation will protect your consumers and keep them coming back. And marketing is essential. Um, people don't buy what they don't know about. Advertise. So any other questions? questions. I know that was a lot, but this was a, a basic 101 intro.
Okay, if no questions, I know that was a lot. Um, I'm gonna leave you with, let me go back and share this again. Did that too quick. So some resources to look at as a market gardener, uh, books by Elliot Coleman. Cornell has a lot of good guides. The New York Farmers Market Fe Federation. Johnny's library is also great. If you guys have questions, uh, feel free to contact me through here at Cooperative Extension or if you're outside the area, your local Cooperative Extension office. We've got a lot of great resources to help you guys out with. Um, a lot of information. I, I hope uh, you guys enjoyed this. Um, I'll give a couple seconds for any additional questions. Looks like we have one. Um, oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Um, is there anything else that you guys want to know about? Otherwise, I appreciate you being I had a question. Tonight. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Go um, ahead. I just wanted to know what, um, how much are you growing on like acreage or what? you you personally yeah so that's a that's a great question um so as a part-time gardener i have 339 acres of which i use one and i sell about eight thousand dollars in a good year from that one acre um and that's at a very small market plus some other direct sales that go with that okay. um so it, it's possible to make some good side money and that's that's basically part time. If I were doing this full time, I would definitely plant more acres. So. Okay. Thank you. This You're was welcome. wondering because you were talking about it. I was just trying to visualize. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions or? Yes, and we will provide a recording of the video. And I'm also going to send the slides out. The video will go out by YouTube and we'll send a PDF of the slides as well. Um, a lot of great resources from Cornell on market gardening, some great folks, the Eastern Court Office. Uh, feel free to contact us. Other than that, I thank you for your time. And we're late tonight. I apologize for that. But uh, you guys have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, take care. Good night. You too. Good night.